to my feet and a light. Today we're going to wrap up our sermon series that we started a few weeks ago called Running with the Giants, Legacies of Faithfulness. Now I want to set the tone for today by reading to you Ephesians uh, chapter 4. And in this uh, beautiful verse of scripture, it's verse 32, it says this. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ Jesus has forgave you. As we begin looking at this text, we uh, understand that it is a, a theme, a theme that sets the tone for where we're heading. Now today, as we begin looking at the last legacy of faithfulness, we're going to look at the man of Onesimus. And we're going to look specifically at the runaway restored. Now, how many of you have ever been a, a, a runaway in your life? How many of you have ever run from a, 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 an item or maybe run from a, a person or a place or a thing throughout the course of your life? How, how many of you have ever been a runaway? How many of you have ever had God impress upon you that you needed to do something and then you went the opposite way? And people sometimes run from their past. Sometimes they run from their pain. Sometimes they run from their sin. Sometimes, yes, people run from truth. You see, I'd venture to say every one of you, whether you want to admit it or not, and maybe even recognize it or not, every one of you, even myself included, we've all been a runaway at different times in our lives. We've run from God when we needed to run to God. We've run from our past when we needed to face our past. You see, today what we understand is that many times when we find ourselves experiencing those runaway moments, or even if we know an individual that is a runaway right now, that, that sometimes we get overwhelmed. We get overwhelmed with maybe shame or, or, or fear, and sometimes we simply just want to hide. But every individual that's ever been a runaway at some point in life, every individual realizes that running away is not the answer, right? Right? It never is. Actually, what we understand is running away from God, running away from your mistakes, running away from your failures will never give you the answer you're looking for. It'll never give you the peace that you desire. You need to run to God and run to Him today. As we begin looking at the account of the life of Onesimus, we look at a runaway that's been restored. And it's interesting because there's very few times that we actually look at a runaway as a hero. But that was the case all the way back in 1912. I mean, to go back in time with me just for a little while. Now, I want you to think back to April 15th, 1912. The time was 2.20 a.m., and the man was John Harper. John Harper was a, a minister. He was a, a preacher by trade. He was a, a great preacher, actually. And it was the very last sermon that he would ever deliver, 2.20 a.m. You see, John Harper was a man who used to be a runaway. He ran from the Lord for many years in his life. He ran from his past. He ran from his mistakes. He ran from his sin. He ran from his failures. And then one day, God finally caught up with him and gripped his heart, gripped his mind, and got his attention. And from that point on, after he had surrendered his life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he knew that the one thing that he was called to do, the one thing that he had a passion, a burden to do, was to tell others about Jesus. And so he made it his mission. He became one of the great preachers of his time, even though very few people know him today. He preached in churches in Glasgow and England. And he was so good that Moody Bible Church even offered him the invitation to come and become their new preacher. And so he got his six-year-old daughter and a relative who was serving as a nanny, for his wife had passed away, and they set out on their new adventure. In just a few more weeks, they would start at Moody Bible Church in Chicago, and he was overly excited. And as they boarded the ship, they knew that it would be an adventure to remember. They just didn't know how much it would change their lives. And then on April the 15th, 1912, at 2.20 a.m., the Titanic sank. A few hours earlier, he had the opportunity to take his six-year-old daughter and the nanny 
and put him on one of the lifeboats so they could get to safety. As a single dad, he was actually given the opportunity to stay with them and be with them so that he could be with his daughter. But he refused, and he gave a seat to someone else. And instead of running from the Lord, and instead of running from danger, he ran into danger. And he ran back through the halls and the, uh, the, the aisles of the Titanic warning people the impending danger of what was about to happen not of the titanic but what it would be like of an eternity apart from jesus christ and he preached one last message through all the hallways to anyone and everyone that would listen and the time finally came that he had to jump from the titanic he was forced to jump off the titanic and he was one of the few that had a life vest and as he jumped into the icy water, he was able to cling to a little bit of the wreckage of the Titanic. And soon, there was a crewman that came over, and he clung to the wreckage as well. It was the last sermon John Harper would ever deliver. He asked that one crewman in the midst of those icy waters, Sir, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And the crewman said, No, I do not. One final message he got to preach. And then at the end of that message, he gave up his life preserver to the crew. And he said the reason why was because he knew that if he were to die, he would live forever. But that crewman, he needed to live a little bit longer so he could come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. John Harper would die that night. That crewman, he would live. And in the days that would follow, he would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The very last convert of one final message of a man who used to be a runaway but was restored. And with that restoration, he forever changed the lives of others. You see, when we begin thinking about runaways, we don't always think of them as heroes. But John Harper's one act underscores the essence of being a hero. You see, a hero, by definition, are people that do not run away. They stay with courage and conviction to stand and face difficulty, accepting hardship and embracing self-sacrifice. They're willing, if necessary, to go down with the ship. On the other hand, those who flee in the critical moment are not viewed as heroes. And that's what makes our final legacy of faithfulness so amazing. You see, Onesimus was a, a runaway. Yet in spite of all of his weaknesses and all of his failures, the Lord rescued him, transforming his testimony from tragedy to triumph. And he still does the same thing with every single sinner that he restores and redeems today. How many of you praise God for that? Amen? And so as we begin looking at the account of Onesimus, we are reminded that there is hope to be found today. Some of you came in here today and you are running from something. Some of you came in here today, and you're running from pain, you're running from sin. Some of you came in here today, you're running from the Lord. Some of you came in here today, and you haven't run from the Lord for many years, but you know someone who is running today. And you can learn from the life of Onesimus. A runaway has been restored. In Acts 3, 19 through 20, it reminds us of these words. It says, Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And so today, we look at the account of hope. We look at the account of forgiveness, and we look at the importance of a runaway who's been restored and how he changes the life of others. Would you stand with me? And we're going to read Philemon, Verses 8 through 20. The Word of God gives us this account. It says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. 
I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this is perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever no longer as a bondservant or a slave, but more than a, a bondservant or a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. To say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. That benefit is, refresh my heart in Christ. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, this day we come to you and we pray. We pray for a season of refreshing. We pray for a season of refreshing to fall upon our community, to fall upon our nation, to fall upon our church, to fall upon our lives. I pray, Father God, that this day that you would remind us of our hope that is in Christ Jesus alone. And that today, no matter what trial, no matter what difficulty we are enduring, that it is through you alone that there is hope. It is through you alone that there is restoration and forgiveness. And it is through you alone that we will find our strength to endure. And so this day we give you praise. And this day we honor you. May you give us wisdom as we study your word. And may we truly be transformed into a better Christian, a stronger Christian that would honor and serve you the remainder of our days. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for God's word. The big idea that we're going to wrestle with today has everything to do with hope. Hope is revealed. Hope is revealed as a redeemer restores, revives, and refreshes the broken heart. I love the idea that, that hope can only be found through Christ alone. I love this principle and this truth because our, our world wants to convince you that there are hope to be found or there's hope to be found in many different avenues or in many different ways, from philosophies to theologies to any kind of uh, human advancement that, that mankind may offer, from, from drugs to alcohol, whatever the case may be, there are people in this world that will try to convince you that that is where you're going to find hope. But it's not true. The true, lasting hope is only found in and through our Redeemer. As He restores, as He revives, and He refreshes, yes, you and me, the brokenhearted at times in our life. As we begin looking at the account of Onesimus, we're going to look at three lessons. Three lessons from a restored, learned from a restored runaway. Now, if you have your Bibles open, I want you to turn with me, and I want you to look at verses 1 through 7 just for a few minutes. It's here where we begin seeing a little bit of the background. We understand that this letter was written by the Apostle Paul, and he was writing from his first imprisonment in Rome. And as he's writing this letter, if you could just picture this setting for a moment, okay? It, it all goes into understanding the, the full breadth, the, the, the full brunt of, of the idea of forgiveness. So, so picture this setting. Here is Paul. He's an apostle. He has been imprisoned for speaking and for proclaiming the word of God, for speaking of Jesus Christ. And there he is in prison. And he is writing this letter on behalf of another. And as we understand that he writes this letter, he is writing to a fellow brother in Christ by the name of Philemon. And Philemon, he was a Christian. And not only was he a Christian, he was a man of God that was known for his love. He was a man of God that was known to come alongside of his brothers and his sisters in Christ, to encourage them, to lift them up, to encourage them to use their talents and their gifts to serve the living God. Those that were brokenhearted, he came to minister to. You see, Philemon was a fellow brother in Christ. He was a servant of the Lord, and he was a soldier of Christ. Now, that is very important because we understand this about Philemon. He was truly a man of God. 
But even men of God, even the most devout of Christians, struggle from time to time when it comes to forgiveness. All of us want forgiveness, and we desire forgiveness. But how many out of you have ever find, or found a time in your life where it was hard to extend a hand of forgiveness? Anybody ever struggle with that at any point in your life? Yes or no? As a Christian? You see, I want you to imagine that for a moment. Imagine that time, or go back in that time in your own life where you found that it was difficult. You, you knew you needed to do it, right? And you knew it was the right thing to do. And you knew as a man or a woman of God that this is what God wanted you to do. And deep down, you wanted to do it, but emotionally, psychologically, maybe from a physical standpoint, you were so overwhelmed and you just couldn't find yourself to let go of that anger and that hurt and that pain and extend forgiveness. Have you ever been there at all? If you have, you know what Philemon is going through. Why? Well, Philemon, he was a wealthy Christian. And he owned slaves. And Onesimus was one of his slaves. Onesimus was a slave who had run away. And he had caused much damage to Philemon because he ran away. He had cost him greatly. And he had hurt Philemon. Now, the interesting thing about Onesimus, as we read through this account, is Onesimus was a man that he wanted to get lost. Have you ever known someone like that? That they move to a big city or they maybe go to a big church because they just want to be lost among the crowd? They don't want to have people really uh, grab a hold of them and talk to them too much, but they do want to be acknowledged a little bit. They, they, they want to be a number. They don't really want to be a highlight. And so Onesimus, he was one of these individuals that he traveled to Rome, and he traveled to Rome with the specific desire to be lost in the crowd. But in his desire to be lost, God had a plan for him to be found. And not only found, but restored, redeemed, and delivered. We understand that Paul, as he's writing this letter, he's sending it on behalf of Onesimus, who was a slave of Philemon, the one who had wronged Philemon. And he writes, and the name Onesimus, just for you to put in the back of your notes or in the back of your mind, the name Onesimus in the Greek language, it actually means useful. Now that's going to come back to us here in just a, a few minutes, why that's so important. But throughout the letter, we observe that Paul, he identifies himself. Get this, this is crazy. Paul actually identifies himself as an old man. How many of you are like, woohoo? Yeah, nobody likes to look at it and say, I'm going to identify myself as an old man, right? But it's interesting. Why does Paul identify himself as an old man? It was a sign of respect. It was a sign of maturity in the Greek culture. He identified himself as an old man, and with that came maturity. With that came wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And so when he's writing to Philemon, he's not just writing to Philemon as a fellow brother in Christ. He's writing to him as one who has been seasoned. One who is a seasoned Christian. And one who has struggled with forgiveness himself. And one who is reminding Philemon that now is the time for you to step up and be the man of God that he's called you to be. Because what you are about to face is going to try you. We don't look at the letter of Philemon that way. But that's what we find in these verses. Philemon, he's introduced as one who loves the Lord and his fellow saints. He's a beloved and fellow worker for Christ, one who has faith in the Lord and one who shares his faith with others, and one who is known to refresh other believers. The idea of refreshing in the Greek, it means to come alongside of and minister to such a way that that man or that woman, that brother or sister in Christ, that they can find themselves just have a little bit of rest, a little bit of rest from their weary, weary day or their weary, weary week or their weary, weary journey they've been on. And that was Philemon. He was the man that came alongside and refreshed his brothers in Christ. 
Wouldn't you like to be that person? To be known as one who refreshes? There's several different kind of people in the world, isn't there? There are those who refresh, and those are the people that you want to be around. And then there are those who drain, and those are the people you try to avoid. How many of you know people like that? Philemon wasn't one who drained others. He refreshed them. Now, picture that. This is so important for us to remember. Because as Onesimus comes and he delivers a letter that Paul is writing, if you could picture the setting, Philemon, as he is getting this letter, he is receiving it from his runaway slave. Now, do you picture that? The runaway slave brings a letter. He goes to Rome to get lost, and there he finds the apostle Paul. And he would have known the Apostle Paul because Philemon and the Apostle Paul were friends. They were co-workers. They knew each other. So this slave would have known the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul would have most likely known Onesimus. And he didn't see him as a runaway slave. He saw him as a man who had a desperate need for Jesus Christ, who had a desperate need to be restored and redeemed and delivered. And so Paul began ministering to Onesimus. And somewhere along the line, we don't know how, we don't know when, but Onesimus gave his life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And as he gave his life to Christ, there came a conviction upon him that he needed to make himself right with Philemon, the one who he had wronged. And as he came, he delivered a letter, a letter that Paul had written. And imagine this just for a moment. Imagine Philemon sitting on a chair, and there right before him is Onesimus, the one that had betrayed him, the one that had wronged him. And Philemon is reading this letter. Could you imagine the setting? I mean, we don't think about that, do we? Here was a man that would have been overwhelmed emotionally and ready for revenge, even as a strong Christian. He would have been tempted by that. So the very first lesson that we begin picking up on is found in verses 8 through 10. And it's lesson number one. That's the principle of petition. Now we need to see what happens here. We know that Philemon would have understood the doctrine of, found, er, of forgiveness. And he would have understood the foundation and the importance. And it would have been enough for the apostle Paul to order Philemon to do what is right because he was an apostle. And he had that kind of a relationship with Philemon, but he didn't order Philemon to do what was right. He petitioned, or he made a plea to Philemon. And that plea was something very simple. Philemon, you are a man of God. You are a man of love. You are a man that knows what it means to forgive others. And I know that you have to fight every fiber in your body right now because you are angry, you are ready for revenge, and I want you, Philemon, to be reminded that as a man of God, you are called to be the man of God. Don't we all need encouragement like that from time to time, yes or no? And that's what Paul was doing here, wasn't he? He wasn't ordering Philemon to do what was right. He was making the plea, Philemon, 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 you are a man of God. Do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, hear that. Hear the passion behind the plea, because this very much was a passionate plea. Now look at this just for a moment. We understand that as he writes, despite Philemon's spiritual maturity and deep love for Paul, the apostle knew that it would be humanly difficult for him to forgive Onesimus. And as Philemon read this letter, Onesimus was no doubt standing in front of him. And as he viewed his runaway slave, he had caused so much trouble, he might have struggled to control his emotions. And so Paul writes, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you, get this, I appeal to you for my what? My child, Onesimus whose father I became in my imprisonment. Now, now, do you see this? This is a letter from a father trying to make sure that he speaks on behalf of his son because he knows his son is facing certain death 
certain imprisonment, even crucifixion, if that's what it would, would require. That was the penalty for a runaway slave in the time. And he knew that his son might face death. And here was a passionate father saying, he's transformed, he's transformed, he's transformed. How many of you have ever wanted to make a plea on behalf of your child? Grandchild, niece, nephew, a friend. And that plea was so passionate. And maybe that plea you made to others, and maybe that plea you made to the Lord. But I guarantee that you are familiar with the petition, with the petition and the plea that is given here. You see, the principle of the petition has three elements, and here it is. You want to make a petition that really changes the future? Then it starts right here with what we see in these verses. Number one, element number one, the principle of petition that changes the future is reinforced by the boldness in Christ. It's reinforced by boldness in Christ. We look at this, and Paul says, I am bold enough in Christ to command you, but instead I make this plea before you. The idea to be bold, it literally means to have enough confidence. Now that's not how we often describe boldness today in our culture, is it? But he's saying, here it is, I have enough confidence, Philemon. I have confidence in the Lord, and I have confidence in you as a man of God that you're going to do what is right, and so I make this plea to you. And if you want to make a petition, you want to make a petition or a plea that changes the future of other people's lives, then make sure that you are resting in the confidence of Christ alone. That the plea that you make that it is in line with God and His Word and His will. And when you do that, you will experience great boldness in your life. When you come Sunday after Sunday, a plea is made, right? Plea of the Word. And that plea, it gives you confidence as you leave and as you go throughout the week so that you can live for God even better than before. Element number two that we see here is not only is this plea reinforced by boldness in Christ, but it is also driven by love. It's driven by love. We see that as Paul is making this plea before Philemon and even, yes, before the Lord, that he is doing it as one that is driven by love not driven by his own motivation, not driven by his own will, not driven by his own desires, even though, yes, he wants Onesimus to be restored from Philemon. No, 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 he's driven by love. He loves the Lord his God. He loves Philemon, and so he makes his request. He loves him so much that he wants Philemon to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And so he's driven by love. And then finally, the last element that we see is that a petition that changes the future is one that is bolstered by humility. It's undergirded by humility. Paul would have been able to go ahead and command Philemon to do this, to carry out what was required, but no, instead, he says, no, no, I'm a prisoner for the Lord. No, 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 I am one who is an old man now. I am one who is a, a father of my spiritual son here, Onesimus. He humbles himself before Philemon, and in so doing, he reminds him, Philemon, 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 whatever you do, do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. We need that encouragement. Because as strong as you are in your walk with the Lord, there are going to be days that you're going to face where you are going to be tempted to look the other way. Or you're going to be tempted to take matters in your own hands. So let us learn from the Apostle Paul. And let us be one of those that come alongside and encourage our fellow Christians to encourage them when they need it the most. Encourage them to exercise forgiveness, to encourage them to exercise love, to encourage them to live out God's truth. Remember that Ephesians 4.32 passage? It says, Be kind to one another and tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. And what's interesting is Onesimus would have seen all of this 
all of these characteristics and much more in the life of the Apostle Paul, right? Not only that, he would have seen it in the life of Philemon. And so now, now was a time where the rubber meets the road for Philemon. Now was a time that his faith really was going to be tested. The man who had wronged him, the man who had betrayed him, the man who had caused so much harm for his own life, would he forgive him? As Onesimus saw all of these characteristics in the life of Paul, he understood and he knew that he could no longer be a runaway that ran from the Lord and ran from his master. And so he chose, he chose to surrender his life to Christ as Lord and Savior. What we find is that when we run away, it wears us out. How many of you could ever testify to that? The more you run, the more weary you become. And the more weary you become, the more mistakes you make. And I'm here to tell you today that you need to stop running from the Lord. He's ready to restore you this day. And so the principal petition, lesson number one, is very simple. Never stop seeking the will of the Lord. As you make your petition this day, as you make your plea on behalf of others, as you come alongside of a fellow brother or sister in Christ and you would come to encourage them, whatever you do, don't stop seeking the will of the Lord. And make that plea to them for them not to stop seeking the will of the Lord. But whatever you do, find a fellow brother or sister in Christ this week and encourage him, encourage him, encourage him because there are many today that they need your encouragement. You already know what to do, what is right in the eyes of the Lord, but you need the encouragement to stay the course and just do it. And don't think you don't. You're going to be tempted. You're going to be tried. And you're going to be sifted. And you need encouragement. Lesson number two. Lesson number two comes to us in verses 11 through 14, and it's the law of restoration. And the law of restoration is here. It's found in the little nuances of this text. And, and it's so subtle that sometimes we overlook it. But notice for a moment the play on words that's used by the Apostle Paul in verse 11. I, I love what we see here. He says, formerly he, referring to Onesimus, he was useless to you. Now remember that Onesimus' name, his very name means useful. And so Paul says, formerly he was useless to you. But now he is indeed useful to you and to me. And he says, I'm sending him back to you, but not as just a slave. I am sending back to you as one that is my very heart. Otherwise, he's saying, Onesimus now is one that I have ministered to, I have mentored, I have trained, I have discipled. He has the same values that I have. As I send him, I am sending my very heart. And so he's not sending him back as just an ordinary man, but he is sending him back as one who has been radically transformed and changed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is a man that's going back to Philemon. A man that is ready to accept the consequences, even if that meant death. We understand that as we look through these verses... The Onesimus was now useful because he had the same core values and beliefs as the Apostle Paul. He is a servant of the Lord. If we look at the text in verse 13, he said, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf as I am imprisoned for the gospel. But look at verse 14. He said, but I didn't want to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion but of your own accord. And so here we understand that Onesimus is going back because he has reached the point where he understands he needs to repent. Repentance has become an ugly word in our culture, and it's really meant to be a beautiful word. Have you ever thought about that? When we think of repentance, automatically people begin to tense up. Like, well, don't do that. That's kind of ugly. But the point is, when you begin... Hearing the word repentance, so many people begin to tense up because it's not a word that they want to hear. Because with repentance comes sacrifice. With repentance 
means that you go to the Lord and you admit to the Lord that yes, you have been in the wrong. With repentance comes a changed life. A willingness to no longer keep doing what you're doing, but to change your ways and draw near to the Lord. And so Onesimus has reached this point where he knows that he needs repentance. And there are three different parts to the law of restoration that you don't want to miss today when you look at these verses. Here it is. Are you ready? Part number one to the law of restoration is that restoration is always preceded by repentance. In Acts chapter 3, 19 through 20, it says, Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Some of you in here today, you are longing for a time of refreshing. You're longing for restoration. Before that can happen, you need to turn to the Lord and you need to repent. How many of you have ever found that repenting is easier said than done. Anybody? Repenting, as easy as it sounds, is hard. Because it requires us not just to say, I'm sorry to the Lord, not just to confess our sin, but to be willing to draw near to the Lord and to turn away from that sin. The idea of repentance is a transformed or a changed life. And so when we look at restoration, we understand that it's always preceded by repentance, and that's what we see in the life of Onesimus. Part number two is that restoration brings a strengthened resolve. When you are restored, then there is a a resolve that you have, a resolve that you want to share Christ with anyone and everyone that will listen. How many of you remember when you first became a Christian? How many of you remember that passion you had when you first became a Christian that you were so overwhelmed with so much passion and so much joy that you couldn't wait to tell everyone and anyone about Jesus Christ and you were talking about a mile a minute and you just didn't care because you just wanted everyone to hear and you were so overwhelmed with joy. Anybody ever been that way? Only a few of you? You remember that feeling? I remember that feeling. I just couldn't wait to share that with everyone and anyone that would listen. It's interesting because some of you today, you need restoration right where you're at. Some of you need to be restored in your relationship with the Lord. Some of you need to be restored in your relationship with your wife or your husband or your children. Some of you need to be restored when it comes to the area of forgiveness. That not only do you need to extend the hand of forgiveness, but you need to seek the forgiveness of the Lord. There are many of you here today that you need restoration in your life. And when you experience that restoration from the Lord, I'm telling you today that you are going to have a strengthened resolve, that you are going to want to share more and more about his love and his joy with others around you. There's no greater feeling. Part number three, here it is. Restoration brings the right tools to better glorify God than ever before. In 1 Peter 5, verse 10, it says, And after you suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore and confirm and strengthen and establish you. It's interesting because we have a wrong idea of restoration in our culture. When we think of restoration, we think of restoring something to its original beauty, right? But a biblical understanding of restoration is that it is a transformation and that you become a better you than you've ever been before. How many of you would like to be a better you than you were last week? Anybody? How many of you would like to be a better you this afternoon than you were this morning? Anybody? How many of you have kids? How many of you got frustrated with kids early this morning, grandkids, nieces, nephews? Anybody? How about this week? Anybody ever had that happen? Only a few of you? It's interesting because we think about that and we think about the restoration that we need even on a daily basis, right? And here it is that God promises that as we are restored through him and in him alone, through Christ Jesus, then we become a better you than what we've been in the previous state before. I once knew a man that he came to me and he said, you know, Tim, he said, I, I, I just can't give my life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because I am afraid that I have to stop being who I am. And he didn't want to stop being the person that he was, 
and he couldn't comprehend that God was going to make him into a better version of him than he had ever been before. Never did give his life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because he didn't want to give up the here and now. He didn't want to give up who he was to become a better version of who he could be. If you're an individual that you want to be a better you than you've ever dreamed of being, then you need the restoration of Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget that. What we understand is lesson number two is the law of restoration. And here it is. God's restoration is greater. Dot, dot, dot. Don't forget that. God's restoration is greater than your sin. God's restoration is greater than your past. God's restoration is greater than your failures. God's restoration is greater than the best you there is today. You can be a better you tomorrow. Isn't that our desire? To grow closer and closer to the Lord so we become a better, a better Christian, a better husband, a better wife, a better son, a better daughter, a better child of God. We never stop growing, do we? And so here it is that God's restoration is greater than anything that you could imagine. And you need it today. The final lesson, lesson number three. It's the model of mercy. The model of mercy is found in verses 15 through 20. We're just going to wrap it up here. As we begin looking at these verses, it's here where the Apostle Paul begins reminding of Philemon of the importance of being a Christian that refreshes, refreshes the lives of others. And he makes four requests of Philemon. First, he asks Philemon to receive Onesimus as he would receive Paul. This means as a fellow brother in Christ and no longer as an unbelieving slave. Second and third, Paul asks on, on a couple different occasions here that any items that Onesimus has cost Philemon that he would charge to Paul's account. And Paul says, I will repay it. I will do whatever it takes for you to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord and to come alongside of my son Philemon or my son Onesimus. When we look at number four, and that is that finally the request that is made is for Philemon to refresh the heart, er, the heart of Paul in Christ. Literally mean to cause his heart to be refreshed in Christ alone or to rest in Christ alone. And so he says, you really want to encourage me, Philemon? You really want to refresh my heart? Then whatever you do, do what is right. Do what is right. Do what is right. And in so doing, you will bring great, great refreshing to my life. How many of you have ever had a son or a daughter or a family member that did what was right, even though maybe others didn't, and you were overwhelmed with pride? Anybody? Have you ever seen that happen? What's so exciting here is that the Apostle Paul is reminding Philemon to do what is right, to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord, and he would be overwhelmed with joy. And so he makes his request before Philemon. By Roman law, a third of the population were slaves. And by Roman law, we understand that Philemon could have had Onesimus beaten, imprisoned, even crucified, because he was a slave that had run away and he had even stolen from him. And the Romans cracked down hard on this, and the penalty was severe because they couldn't have discord in their environment. It was a different time, a different place, I understand. But the big question is, what happened to Onesimus? Did, did Philemon really forgive him? Did Onesimus have that restoration that he was longing for from Philemon? Well, this is what we know from history. History records that around A.D. 110, an early Christian leader by the name of Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch, he wrote a letter to the church at Ephesus. And in that letter, he addressed the bishop of Ephesus multiple times, repeatedly noting that the church, or the leader of the Ephesian church, was a man named, anybody want to guess? Onesimus. 
get this though, it gets better. It, it goes on, and church tradition suggests that Onesimus was a servant to the apostle Paul and to other apostles until their deaths. And then, get this, he was able to preach the gospel in places like Spain and Colossae before becoming the minister in Ephesus. And he was reportedly martyred during the reign of the Emperor Trajan for his refusal to deny Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This former slave of men had become a slave of Christ. And as a witness of church history indicates, Onesimus faithfully served his heavenly master until the very end. Now that is cool. You can say that in church, by the way. Isn't that awesome? That here it was, here was a runaway, a runaway that had been restored. And he was so restored that God used this runaway to become a hero, to become one that would preach the gospel. And I'm here to tell you today, whatever you're running from or whatever you've run from in the past, that the Lord can restore you and use you to make a mighty difference in the lives of others for eternity. And how many of God's people say amen to that? So here it is, lesson number three. We're going to end with this, the model of mercy. Forgiveness brings a time of refreshing, but it also brings focus. It brings a focus, a clarity to your life, a clarity to your mind, a clarity to your purpose, so that you can go out there and share the love of God greater than before and with more passion than before. 